Who knows the name of this mountain right here? Makana. I think it's probably one of the more famous ones because you can see it all the way from Princeville. You sit at Princeville Hotel and drink your Mai Tai and watch the sunset. You're going to see, you're going to look down there at the mountain. And, uh, but in the ancient days, this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient Hawaiian world because of this. And who knows the name of this cliff? This is called Kapale Oahe O Makana. Literally the fire throwing cliff of Makana. And, and I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is kind of, this is like the inside of a crater. And, uh, and it's eroded away on the outside. I'm gonna have to talk to my geologists over here later about, about, about this. But it, that's what it looks like to me. Anyway, it's got these arms like this side over here, they come out. And so what happens when you get the trade winds, they suck right up the face of this. It's like a chimney that sucks the wind right up the face of it. And in the ancient days, they would have a fire throwing ceremony from the very top of that mountain. And not like every full moon or you know, every Monday or something like that. Under very special circumstances. If a high chief came to Hyena, if a class was graduating from the halal um, at, at, the, at the end of the road or some auspicious uh, auspicious um, circumstance and, and we have a wonderful mo'olelo passing down the knowledge of this ceremony and we actually have um, elders or families in Hyena whose ancestors were the last ones to throw the firebrands from the top of Makana in the early 1900s and uh, so it was I'm not sure this next picture is going to show up too well but uh, but it was quite exciting. Here's the poster. In, in New Year's, New, New Year's um, 2012, um, one of the descendants who, who, who told me his, his tutu man, the last guy, had come to him in a dream and talked to him about it's time to go up and, and go and do this. And I'll tell you what, I've climbed around on all, top, all, top, all those mountains up there, and this is one I never, I always got to a point where I felt, I wasn't supposed to go. I wasn't supposed to go because this place is for only certain people to go. And, and, and Moko and his, his brother and, and, or his son actually and his cousin uh, went up there and reenacted this. So I, I brought a bunch of propaganda over here we can look at later. <laughs> In, including this was the book, uh, this was published in, in 1921 but this is the legend book that my great 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 grandfather wrote all in Hawaiian, it was translated by my grandmother's sister and it published in 1921. So um, this is, anyway, we get, we, I, like I said, I got a few propagandas over here. Okay, uh, but, but the most famous of all these vahipana, and vahipana means story place. So there's a difference between a vahipana and a vahikapu. Vahikapu is like a place that is sacred and, 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 and and, uh, and, and, and you shouldn't go unless you have specific business or relationship there. Many vahi pana uh, or story places are vahi kapu, but there is a, there is a difference. But uh, the most famous of all these is this point over here. So this is, the co this is a little cove there at the very end of the road at Ka Beach. And, and, and this area um, is, and you can see down here, this is another perspective of it, you can see the channel over here. Um, uh, this is famous for a heiau called Ka'ulu a Pao'oa, um, the inspiration of Pao'oa. And Pao'oa was uh, a, a very fast companion, a close companion of, of probably one of the more famous, if not one of, or maybe even the most famous chief of, of Kauai and Hyena, a chief named Lohiao. And Lohiao and, and Pao'a were, were companions, and, and, um, and, th and this was a sacred temple site surrounding Ke'ahua Laka, the altar of Laka, which for hula practitioners is one of the most uh, sacred places for them. And, and, and the reason for that is because this is where Pele came. Pele was asleep on the big island, and in her spirit form, she, uh, oh, Sorry, we're not, we're not a close up. There's Ke'ahua Laka up here. And so this whole area over here was, is part of Ka'ulu Apaua. Um, and I believe the Historical Society has a fantastic, a fantastic map that was drawn by a man named Henry K. Kuhuna. 
And, and I was very pleased that my grandmother was involved in, in having Henry K. Kuhuna um, and, and Thomas Hashimoto uh, as his assistant clear that whole area and map it in, I think it was like in the 1950s or something like that. And, and uh, it's quite a, quite a um, famous map and, and uh, documents this area uh, really well. But it's, this is the most famous area because this is where Peli came in her spirit form. She turned into a beautiful woman uh, we, and, 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 was, and was attracted into the, in, into the gathering. And of course, these chiefs, especially Chief Lo Hiao, they had never seen this woman before. They thought, you know, where did, this, where did this Malahini come from? Where did this foreigner come from to be in our midst? And she said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. And to prove it, she began to chant the names of the winds of Niho, and then Niihau, and then Kauai, valley by valley by valley, every single one of the names of the winds. And, and uh, so anyway, it's a, it's a really long story, and I, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, because, but, it's, but this kind of puts us on the map, literally on the map for hula practitioners, um, and, and makes this, uh, this one of the most sacred, uh, sacred areas. And so really dedicated hula, practitioners make a pilgrimage here at some point um, in their in, in their lives because of that uh, because of that so anyway let's move up a little bit to to the time of the Maheli well in the Maheli which which first of all I, I think it would not do justice if I didn't try and give you my version of the Maheli um, it was a it was um, it, it was a process that was really counter to everything Hawaiians believed. And, and, and so when I say that, in, in traditional Hawaiian belief and cosmology, uh, land was not a commodity that could be owned or could be bought or could be sold. Land was actually a, 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 fil a familial uh, member, so a member of, literally a member of your family. And in, 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 the, in, the, in the line of, of uh, Papahana Moko, uh, Papahana Moko, literally Mother Earth who gives birth to islands. Uh, Papahana Moko mated with Wakea, Father Sky, and the firstborn were the islands um, from that union. And, and, and later, uh, the, uh, the first taro plant, Haaloa, the long breath that goes all the way back to the beginning of time, uh, was was born and then the third uh, was man and so I really butchered and oversimplified a very complex relationship there but anyway the idea is we're the younger sibling and our family is the natural world around us and and the geological world around us so um, you know that relationship of respect to your elders and in turn your elders taking care of you was, was a very reciprocal, very important relationship that allowed our ancestors to be able to survive and, and not only survive but prosper and, and honor the, the natural world around them in that process. And, and so uh, when the idea that if you put in a, a request you could now own a piece of land, that was a, that was a very difficult that was a very difficult thing, I think, for many of our, uh, of, of our Hawaiian ancestors to understand. Nonetheless, it proceeded. And it was a, it's often given just a single date, but it was a series of, of, of enactments that took place from 1846 all the way up until 1855. And in that process, the entire Ahupua of Hyena, which was estimated at 2,500 acres, was given to a man named Abner Paki. We're going to talk a little bit more about Paki in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, 34 land claims were made by the Makainana. So the, the, the Makainana are the fishermen and the farmers, the, the people who literally lived on the land and worked with the land. Only 34 claims. It's kind of hard for me to believe that there were only 34 families living in this, in this Ahupua, which was a land of so much abundance. Um, of those 34 claims, only 21 were actually given land commission awards. So 
you see a, a number of them did not even successfully get through that land commission award process and it was a it was quite a quite a quite a um, foreign process and a, and a difficult process um, those total of those land commission awards was 41 acres so so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use this as an example. I didn't run the math on this, but if somebody were to divide 41 by 2,500, you'd come up with the percentage, which is like really small, right? And, and so in general, when the, when the Maheli took place, it, I, I know this is going to sound like totally crazy, but there's actually traditional, this is partly a traditional process. So. Let, let me back up. I'm sorry, I'm going to ramble, but the sun's going down and it's getting cooler, so if I go on too long, that's okay. Uh, so, in the ancient days, before Captain Cook ever arrived, um, there was always, there was always um, competition and conquest and, 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 and struggle between chiefs, and, uh, and the paramount chiefs uh, would, that succeeded through conquest and warfare to take over uh, Moku or entire uh, Mokupuni, entire islands, um, would then redivide, redistribute the Ahupua to the to the chiefs that had put them in power. Right. So if if these chiefs came along and helped this paramount chief with his conquest and they succeeded, then they would be distributed. Uh, these these lands. Now, why was that important? First of all, in, in, in ancient days, um, the wealth of the land was the produce of the land, right? So there was no cash, there was no cash system. So um, an ahupua like Hyena that produced an abundance of food would be a very valuable resource because the abundance of food would give you, would allow you to sustain a court, it would allow you to dabble in the arts, it would allow you to propel your society to a higher level. And in fact, the abundance of food in the Hawaiian Islands uh, during that, those, those years allowed Hawaiian civilization to evolve uh, beyond any other civilization in Polynesia. And it was really that abundance of food that, that, that allowed that to happen. So this practice of redistributing the, the land to, to, the, to your loyal chiefs was actually a very traditional practice. However, um, what took place in this process was a little different because, uh, because of what followed. So, we, so when the Maheli took place, basically one third of the land went to the king as a personal possession. So uh, one third of the land went to the crown or to the government. But since that was the king, it was kind of the same thing. <laughs> Although not really, because you may hear this term today the crown lands, which remain a contested part of the land base of the Hawaiian Islands. And so keep that in mind. So one third to the king, one third to the crown, and one third was distributed to all of his loyal chiefs. Well, the king, when, he, when, they, when they were debating whether this was a good idea, was kind of told that this is a way of, of ensuring all of your loyal subjects, all of the makainana actually become, you know, become owners of land. They can control their destiny. They will have, they will, they will, they will never be able to be kicked off the land again because they will own it. Well, that probably sounded pretty good, but at the end of the Maheli process, less than one-tenth of one percent of all of the land went to the makainana. Now, I don't know what this percentage is, but it sounds like it could be pretty close to that. Um, and, and, and so, um, one thing though that was encouraging, so let me back up to say, okay, I, we're gonna talk a little bit about Abner Paki. So, so Hyena, the big vast piece of property is given to Abner Paki. Well, who is Abner Paki? He's a father of Powahi Bishop of Kamehameha Schools fame, the Bishop of State. And Paki never set foot on this island. <laughs> so this was simply a political bone thrown to a very, very important and significant chief uh, that was, a, that was a, a loyal 
friend of the commandments. So, so, so there, that, that's who got really the lion's chair. Well, it's very interesting to note that prior to the Maheli, Paki already had put claim on this Ahupua. And in fact, had installed his own Konohiki. Do you guys know what the word Konohiki? Konohiki is kind of like the, the chief responsible for getting all the stuff done in the Ahupua. And, and he somehow he got a bad name like the tax man later on. Uh, <laughs> but but, but uh, my friend Carlos likes to say, you know, the word Konohiki literally means to invite. And if you've got, you know, 200 people living in your Ahupua, you got two ways you can get them to do it. You can threaten them with your stick or your spear, or you can encourage them to do it. And we all know good leaders get far more support from their followers if you can, if you can get them to, to, to support you willingly and not under threat. And so Konohiki, the successful Konohikis had very good working relationship with their, with their, with their uh, people that they, that they govern. And, and uh, so, did they just disappear and come back? Yeah. Oh, Reg is throwing me off over here, okay. I was like, whoa, what happened? Okay, Paki was trying to erase that over there. But the tax man started to show up. The tax man, yeah, so, so, uh, uh, oh, so, but, okay, so here we go. So, and Paki never, but he never set foot, so what did he do? He installed a Konohiki and her name was Kekela. And Kekela, so with, this is a couple interesting things is, you don't hear about too many Wahine Konohiki. So this is another very significant piece of history is, here's a woman who's in charge of this whole very important Ahupua. And, um, and, and so, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting wrapped up in a lot of history. Anyway, sorry I've got to roll back because I didn't cover this piece. So, you all do know that this is the only island that Kamehameha never physically conquered, right? No? Yes? Yes, no. Okay, good. Well, and, and, and of course, we believe that was because of the mana of, of, of our chiefs and, and of this island. And so uh, the, the, the first conquest that, you know, he had this big flotilla and they were coming over and, they, and, and this huge storm picked up while they were in the mid-channel and most of them, all of them drowned. A few may have made it by, on shore by Mahaulepu and, 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 and were promptly killed by uh, Kamoli's uh, troops. Uh, the second invasion, he had literally canoes lined up from Diamond Head all the way to Kayana Point. And, and it was a massive flotilla. And 48 hours before they were supposed to leave, an unknown plague swept through and killed them and, and the canoes were left rotting on the beach. And, and, and so, um, no fool around with Kauai, man. I guess, I guess that's what you And, and so, so, but then, but then after Kamuli's death, uh, the Kamehameha's used Kamuli's son, stupid guy, started a small kind of rebellion and the Kamehameha's used that as an as a opportunity to come in and snuff out their traditional chiefs and to put their people in place. And so prior to the Maheli, we see this in Hyena. So Paki is already controlling the Ahupua. He's brought in his own Konohiki, Kekela. And, um, and so this last statistic here is actually quite important uh, because when Kekela came, she brought a number of people with her. But 15 of the 21 LCAs that were issued are individuals who claim to have received their land during Kamuli'i's time. So these are the real Kama'aina of Hayana and, and not the, the people that had come in with, with Kekela. So there's a, and that's a pretty good percentage. Not, I mean, it could be higher, but at least we get some locals hanging in there. Okay. Are they still around? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of those people's names here in just a minute here. Uh, I think we are anyways. Uh, so, Aina for cash. Okay, remember, test question now. One third of the land went to the? King. One third of the land went to the? Brown. One third of the land went to the? Chiefs. Chiefs. What's really sad is within 20 years, most of those chiefs had lost ownership of their lands. And why is that? Because 
the 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 ali'i starting with starting with the monarchy wanted to demonstrate their affluence through all the accoutrements of western culture let's build a palace let's you know do whatever we're going to do you know do all that kind of stuff and 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 to do all that wear all those fancy clothes do all that kind of stuff what do you need money. you need money you couldn't buy it with fish and poi anymore <laughs> those merchants that were you know had control of all those things wanted cash the only ready thing that they had that they could convert to cash was their land and and so it's really sad to see how quickly the elite were disenfranchised of ownership of their land and and this is another case in point so 1855 Paki passes away and his daughter Powahi inherits the land three years later uh, Powahi conveys this property I use convey because I don't think she actually sold it to him uh, to Willem H. Pease well Willem H. Pease goes down in the history of the kingdom as, as, as the most inaccurate surveyor <laughs> yeah what a title to have right so, so all these uh, now all these ahupa are divided up, and they're based on traditional known boundaries. But now all of a sudden, you needed a deed that had like meets and bounds that that said how big it was. So they had to hire surveyors. Well, Mr. Pease wasn't about to hike up to Hono Ono three thousand three hundred and thirty feet, if it is the top of the ahupa, uh, up by the Alakai Swamp in order to make sure that he was getting the right, you know, meets and bounds of the, of the Ahupua. So he estimated it at 2,500 acres. Um, in fact, he was off by about 30%, so, which is not bad. He's been off by 100% on some other ones. <laughs> so anyway, so Pease gets it. I suspect that Pawa, he had so many Ahupua that she just said, Mr. Pease, rather than me paying you here, how about you take this piece of property way out in Hyena that she would never go to, probably probably viewed it as as you know almost worthless um, so anyway Pease gets it and holds it until he dies and 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 we, when he dies his estate um, then conveys it or sells it to Willem Kinney and and um, I, I got to tell you this really funny um, so we, we our chairman of our board at NTVG for 13 years was 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 is a kinney and um and john plews had somehow figured out this genealogy um and and we bought th so that there's where limhuli gardens office is now is right by the coal pond and and that was a piece of that we didn't get in the partition we actually had to buy it we paid a million dollars for it and and um and and so john said we paid a million dollars for what Doug's great great grandfather paid 75 cents for. <laughs> so there's the value of land uh, land escalation. So anyway, Will and Kinney uh, was quite a character. Uh, he shows up in different places in Kalalau Valley and in, in Hilo, and he's got children all over the archipelago. Uh, he was quite a, a um, I don't know, maybe promiscuous is the right word, uh, 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 man. And, um, and so our chairman, he has all these Hawaiian cousins and you know, and, uh, he also is descended from, uh, from the attorney who prosecuted Queen Lilio Kalani and set, uh, for treason and sentenced her to death. Not a very good claim to fame in Hawaii anyways. Um, so anyway, Kinney holds it for just three years and he sells it to the Hui Kuai Aina O Haena. Have you, any of you ever heard of that name before? I see a few people nodding. So literally that means, what that name is is Hui, the group of people, Kuai is to purchase land. the land of Haena, right? Hui Kuai Aina O Haena. And, and, and so what we find is 38 Hawaiian families got together somehow came up with financing and bought the entire Ahupua back 
from William Kinney. Now, we've gone from 1850s, 25 years later, we've reunited the entire Ahupua with the families that live there. Now, what you need to understand of the, of the Maheli process is it led really, really quickly to, um, it, 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 was, it was a method of forcing people into the cash economy. And so if you got, if you were no longer able to live a subsistence lifestyle, you had to get a job. And you had to go to the store so you could buy your sugar and your flour and whatever you needed. And you couldn't buy it, you couldn't come in and barter, you needed cash. So it forced people into the cash economy. So for the community of Hyena to buy back their entire Aina, now all of a sudden they were back in business. They could live just like their ancestors had for 2,000 years before them. And, and so this was quite a, a, an amazing, an, an amazing um, uh, turn of events. And, and what we find when we study the history of Hawaii is it didn't happen only in Hyena. That in fact, Hawaiians were really smart people. And, and, and th what they were doing was they were saying, we need to learn how to master this system and make it work for our benefit. And, and Holy had an opportunity one year to go to a indigenous gathering in British Columbia. And uh, the keynote speaker was a brilliant uh, Haida Gwaii woman who had grown up in a very traditional society and family and then realized that the only way she could help her people was to, was to get educated. She went off and got a law degree and she ended up being the chief negotiator for an amazing treaty that gave her people, you know, really a lot of indigenous rights. And her talk was uh, mastering the master's tools. And, wow. and, and, and I, th I listened to that talk and I was like, man, our Hawaiians was doing that 100 years ago, <laughs> man. You know, they, they were on top of this within 25 years, they had figured out a way to do it. To, and this happened across the archipelago. Um, unfortunately, the system very quickly realized that this was not in the best interest of creating uh, an effective uh, colonization process. So in, in the early territorial days, they actually passed a law breaking up these huis. And one by one, they were disassembled across the archipelago. And if any of you are really interested, read this book. It's called Kahana how the land was lost, and it is a case study of, 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 of that process at a beautiful valley which is now a state park on the island of Oahu. Um, and this was this uh, Will, uh, uh, Robert Stauffer's PhD that he then turned into a, into a book. It's a fascinating read, so um, part of my propaganda over here. So anyway, this was good stuff. This was really, really good stuff for uh, for, for, the, for the community. So there we have Abner Paki. Now, what do you notice about these people? They're dressed up like they're Western elite, right? It, reality is, these, he, they were living in a grass hut, and if you wore that in your grass hut, I didn't even want, I wanted to come in, have my tank top on and holy made me put on my Aloha shirt so I would look respectable, but who in their right mind walks around dressed like that, you know? Okay, well anyway. I think I made my point. And here's his daughter, uh, Powahi Paki, who then married Charles Bishop. And, and so we've already talked a little bit about them. Um, here's a picture that Haoli found in a stack of pictures that was, it was kind of like nobody knew where it was and they were gonna discard it. And, and so she picked this up and I know it's really hard to tell, but this is Limuhuli Valley right here. And this is Makana Mountain right here. And this is where the Hui Makainana O Makana's Lo'i Restoration Project is right here. This is it. We, we don't know exactly what year that is, but it's probably late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can see, look at these guys. They're all dressed up in their Sunday best. So it's almost certain this was like a Sunday and they were going off to church. I mean, and, they, and so, you know, I don't know who the photographer was, maybe it was Senda or somebody, you know, but Senda wasn't alive yet, but, um, but 
Somebody happened to be there with a camera. This was one of those, like, you put the hood over and you go poof, you know, it's like, yeah. And, 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 uh, and so there we have it. And, and uh, so quite a, quite a, um, a, a phenomenal picture. Um, somebody asked, who were those, who were those people? Well, here is a list of the, of the 38 families that, that purchased the Ahupua of Hyena back. And if we look through those names, we don't see any really that we, uh, that we still recognize today. Although there are quite a few that are, that are ancestors, um, quite a few that are ancestors. Pilani is one, yeah. Um, uh, this is an interesting, interesting name. It's like almost like the Mahawiki family and the Maka family combined. <laughs> Yeah, maybe they maybe they split off to get more land. <laughs> but but these are the this is the 38 families that purchased back the Ahupua of Hyena. And uh, and you know part of our indigenous mapping project that we worked on, we were able to get all these amazing pictures from the Bishop Museum and the State Archives and all these places. Um, and and Carlos was able to utilize a lot of those in his in his, in his in his book so he made this little collage of these are the images of the of the residents of Hyena during that during that period of time and and this man here is quite famous um, he he lived just prior to when Antivai was so Antivai was born in 1931 um, and Paitulu his name is Paitulu and Paitulu was uh, quite an incredible famous fisherman and the legend was that he would actually ride the shark down to Kalalau and back. He had that kind of relationship with the, with, 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 with the ocean. Um, and he lived right down kind of where Joel Pasquale lives today, if any of you know, kind of where that beach right away is to, to Makua or some people call it tunnels, but I'm not gonna encourage you to say that. Um, and, and, then, and then a couple days ago, Helen emailed me this picture. And, um, and this is, is Mrs. Paikulu. Well, Haena actually had a strong relationship with Ni'ihau and, 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 and Kalalau, and the T was often used in place of the K. So what I now have a project to figure out is, is if Mrs. Paikulu was related to Mr. Paitulu. <laughs> I think they were probably husband and wife or brother and sister. But that's a project that we will need the archives of the historical society to, 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 to help solve. Uh, yeah. Look at this picture. There's somebody on horseback. Can you see it back there? Yeah. So here's somebody, this is like up by Windy Point, looking down over the plains of Hyena. What's that? Julian. Julian Rice. This? Yeah. He thinks that's my grandmother. I don't think so, but maybe. But I, I'm, I'm going to get to her in a minute. But okay, um, okay. We showed you that picture. Um, look at this. Who look? Mr. Chuck knows a little bit about dunes and erosion and stuff. Look, oh, wait, wait. Don't panic. I tell people, don't panic. What do I do there? Okay. Um, Look at the dune, no ironwood trees. Actually, I take it back. Here's the first ironwood tree right there. And boy, did they spread. But without ironwood trees, the wind was able to replenish the dune system. And you had a very, you had a very, this is low shrublands. Uh, these were, this was all open. Uh, in fact, they would drive the cattle out of Kalalau and Napali Coast, and this is where the Robinsons had a corral over here. You can see local Naya. This is this was a fish pond that today we can't even figure out how it even got water. And 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 so here we know it's not make believe. Here's local Ka and here's local Naya. So really, I mean, these historical photographs are really quite uh, quite amazing. Look at this one. Uh, the Paniolo were riding bullocks, not horses. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? 
And there's there's Maka, there's Makana Mountain up in the back there behind him. Yeah. That's a real cowboy, bro. <laughs> okay. 1960, look at all the ironwood trees. Completely changed the dynamic of that system. Completely changed it. You can still see people farming, right? This is the Hashimoto's over here, taking care of those lo'i. And here's a, another perspective, same year. Look at all the ironwood trees along the coast. But look at, here's across Limahuli, the lo'i were still being farmed, and in here, and, and they were continued to be farmed there until the Hayanahui partition was concluded, at which time the farmers were evicted um, from that area. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute. Um, but it was a period of time that, that, um, that so you know, I'm, I'm talking now about like the 60s. So I have to tell you, I, I forget where I was supposed to say this in this, but so I was born in 1957, which now tells you how old I am, I turned 60. 1957 was a very significant year in Hyena. Who can tell me why? <laughs> 57, <laughs> 1957 was a year of a major tidal wave that completely destroyed the Hyena community. So when I was growing up, nobody wanted to build back by the ocean and there were all these like cement slabs. That was what we, that's what I remember growing up in Hyena. And, 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 um, and 46 and 50, I actually have a slide later about the tsunami, but um, it, was, it was very interesting growing up in that era. They were, they were still farming. Taro was a staple that could feed the community. And there was lots of longhorn cows. And in fact, back in, when I was growing up, we fenced in the people and the cows ran wild. <laughs> now we fence in the cows and the people run wild. I think it was better before. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if you're a little kid wandering around in Hyena, especially at night, <laughs> this is a scary guy to run into. <laughs> he had sharp horns. And, and it's like way bigger than you are. And you know the law of the jungle, the bigger pig wins, right? So it was, uh, it was a very interesting, we interviewed um, Auntie Bernie Mwahuiki before she passed away. And Auntie Bernie uh, would t told us about, uh, th what was it, the cow jail. And, 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 and how, you know, cows that were unbranded that would, because the cows were going everywhere and, and they would go into people's yards and eat up all their plants and eat their garden. And if they were, un, and if they were unbranded, you didn't know who, who it belonged to. So the, the cow police would take it and arrest it and take it to cow jail. <laughs> and, and you would, yeah, this is true. This is a true story. I'm not making it up. And you would have to pay a fine to get your cow back. But of course, a cow is an important resource. So you would pay your fine and get it back and then you have to brand it. And, then everybody knew, you know, that Samson's cow, then you go go get Samson for replace your vegetables. <laughs> and so this is what our community looked like when I was growing up. This is Uncle Walter's house. Uncle Walter has since passed away. Um, but, you know, it was, um, what, what did they call this? Oh, where's Santo? What? Uh, I know we have an architect in the house. This is what they call vernacular architecture. Is that right? Is that the, that, that's the right term? He's, he's not convinced. I'll talk to him afterward. <laughs> vernacular architecture is kind of this style that resembles so, like Hanalei, you've got a vernacular architectural style, which is a greenhouse with a white railing and, and, and that kind of stuff. And this is, this is the, look, greenhouse with white railing. It's vernacular architecture. Okay. <laughs> so, so then that ushered in this era called the Hayanahui Partition. So that kind of idyllic era from 1875 lasted all the way up until 1967. And, it, and I, I forgot to mention this, but one by one, all of the Hui Kuai Ainas were dissolved across us. 
but not in Hyano. And being a remote community that still had its land base, it meant that our community there was able to take many of their traditional values and practices all the way up into the modern era. And, and, and 67 was still, Hyena was still a sleepy community. I, I remember, so I would have been 10. It was like a big deal in 1967 when, when the tourist car, we called it a stretch, the thing looked like one long limo. limo. And it had like four or five doors on the side. And we'd see like twice a day, only twice a day, you get like 10 p tourists come down there. And 10 tourists, you know what I mean? But it was like a big deal because nobody ever seen one stretched, you know, especially way out in Hyena. And, 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 and so, you know, it was really a, a, a rural community. But then the partition took place. And the partition was a very interesting process. So, um, by 19, so it started in 1955 and concluded in 67. Those 38 families had passed down those shares um, or sold those shares and they become fractionated. And so we had over 100 people claiming some interest in the Hayanahui. And it was a very difficult process to create, an, what, what, what happened is the Fifth Circuit Court had to create, had to align an economic value to the percentage of, of shares that you owned in the Hui. Did that make sense? So if you owned one share out of 38, that would be worth X number of dollars. And then they had to find a piece of real property that would have that value that would match to that. And so it was a really difficult process. And by the late 50s, early 60s, people were beginning to catch on. In spite of the 57 tsunami and the 46 tsunami, they were beginning to catch on that beachfront real estate was going to be in. OK, just to give you an example, who knows how much this piece of property sold for? Who knows who owns that piece of property? Lot 105. Julia Roberts. Who knows how much Julia Roberts paid for this piece of property? I think it was $15 million. Yeah. And, and I, I happen to know it was more than 10, but I think it was 15 because we actually had an incredibly generous donor who had put an offer to buy it for $8 million cash, and he was going to donate it to us. But he couldn't, he couldn't outbid Julia Roberts. So, you know, we're in, a, we're in a problem where every time one of these lots sells for millions of dollars, our real property tax goes up and up and up. And so our longtime owners in Hyena are facing uh, inability often to be able to even hold on to your property because your real property tax. It, and so I just, I want to sow the seed of, of rebellion in all of you that we need we need some real property tax reform to protect our our old families here we really do there are many Bowser institutions that should not be paying tax uh, the botanical garden doesn't pay tax my no. family does pay tax family, okay, that's <laughs> yeah and these are here's my uncle and here's my uncle and here's me and so you know yeah we got we got a problem too so anyway these are so Anyway, oh, you know, I, f I totally missed this, which was, oh, this is probably not a very good one. Maybe when we, uh, I got a map coming up later. Remind me to talk to you about, during the Maheli process, the boundary dispute between Waineha yes. and Hyena. Yes. It's really fascinating, right? So remind me, Makala, don't let me forget. Still today. Still today, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, oh, here's my, here's my tsunami, here, Kalihiwai Bridge. And you know what? Because I wasn't prepared, I'm sure there are like some other better pictures, but this, so this is my placeholder to just say the tsunami of 46 and 57 were devastating to, to, to the Hyena community. 46 particularly because nobody alive had seen a tsunami. And so actually fishermen were going out to gather the fish and people were going out and they were caught by the waves that came in. And, 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 and so it was really a... It was really tragic. 57, obviously, just 10 years later, they knew what, to, they knew what was going to happen. But 
Many people were, were still caught. Uh, I don't believe anybody in Haina died in 57, uh, but it was truly devastating to, to, the, to the community. And now you get to hear a little bit more kind of about my story. So on the, on the, uh, on, on the right here is my tutu lady, uh, Juliet Rice Wickman. Oh look, it's cut off, how come? What happened? There you go, lower them, Chuck. <laughs> Just make that leg in the front a little bit lower. Yeah, anyway, I have to tell you, when, when I was growing up, I was, you know, kind, well, the Hawaiian word is kolohi. <laughs> the, what you want to do is don't ask my parents about it, whatever you do. Um, and if you, I have some family in the crowd here, don't believe anything that they tell you because I wasn't really that bad. But I was pretty. Uh, but I. But I was pretty bad. And this was the woman who took me in when my parents were literally ready to disown me. <clears throat> and in 1972, I got to come and live with her, and um, and spend time in Hyena with her. Um, I, I forgot too also that um, my father. Um, my father is born here on on Kauai, and and when when he was raising us. He would bring us every summer to stay in Hyena with, with, with our tutu ladies. So I was not raised in Hyena except during the summer. And the surf was still pretty good in the summer. You, know. <laughs> you just got to know where to go. And, and, uh, and, and she really instilled in me an incredible love for the Aina, uh, appreciation of the culture. Um, she shared with me her stories of when she was a little girl. And I remember Reg was saying that lady on horseback, you know, he thinks that's my girl. Maybe it was because she would tell me about riding on horseback from their home in, in Kalapaki, on horseback all the way to Hyena. And, 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 and there were no bridges, so you'd, you'd ford through the, through the river mouths. And she, was, she would do that with her grandfather. Um, who was the guy who wrote this book? And every valley, every ahupua they pass through, he would tell her all of the significant place names and the mo'olelo, the stories, and, 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 and it was just such an enriching experience. And, and then they would come to Hyena, and it was, it was for her, it was, a, it was a place she felt she came home to. And, and so, um, when she was raising her kids, she brought them and, and they actually lived for a period of time in Hyena. And so my father did, this, did, did the same thing with us. And it was, it was quite, um, uh, because I was the humbug one, you know, I got to actually become very close to her. And, and she shared so much with me that, that uh, um, I, I can never, ever repay her. Um, and in fact, she was the inspiration for the creation of Limahuli Garden. Um, it was a vision that she had uh, before the partition. Uh, it, she actually had started Limahuli Garden on the other side of Cold Pond, which is, which is now part of the state park. And then in 1967, um, during, well, during that partition process, she, she owned a significant number of shares in the Hui. And, and, and so during that process when they were all, everybody's jockeying for where they're gonna end up with, the, with their property, uh, they thought she was absolutely crazy because she asked that her shares be assigned to the Mauka lands of Limahuli. And, and I, I came across these old uh, maps, in fact the Historical Society probably has these maps, um, but during the partition process, uh, the Fifth Circuit Court had to create um, maps uh, uh, demonstrating the economic value of the different sections of the Ahupua. So the Mauka lands of Limahuli were classified as poor cattle pasture. <laughs> and it was really poor cattle pasture because it's rocky and, you know, all trees and but the Hui did allow their, remember the, hui, the cows ran wild, so the, the, uh, the cows ran throughout the valley and, and, uh, and, and so, so as a result, she was able to get a thousand acre 
a war. Because they thought, you know, this crazy lady, we're going to give her plenty of land, but it's worthless. And, and, we give all, and we're going to get all the other one. So, so that was her dream. And, and so her dream was to create a botanical garden that would continue to protect and preserve and perpetuate that area, to perpetuate the cultural sites, the very important sacred sites of that area, um, and protect the, the incredible biodiversity, which nobody had surveyed, but she knew in her heart existed there. Um, and, and, and so she really set that in motion. And, and when she died in 1987, uh, she left that thousand acre valley to Haole and myself. I guess we drank the Kool-Aid uh, be because we gave it away. Our kids are still trying to figure out why we gave away the only property we ever owned. But, um, uh, and now I got a big mortgage on a place in Kalaheo. But anyway, uh, it, it's, it, when you look at, when you stand, I, I challenge any of you to go stand in Limahuli Garden and look at the, the land, look up the valley, and say that that's something you can own. It's not. She didn't give us something. She gave us a kuleana. She gave us a responsibility. And, 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 and we've taken that very seriously. And I'm very, uh, tonight's not a lecture about Limahuli, but um, it's amazing to see what that garden and preserve have done and, and, and what, they're, what we are protecting through that vehicle. And I can't tell you how many visitors come and, and leave and they'll leave a comment this was the highlight of my trip to Hawaii. And it, you know, this is the real deal, the real deal. So anyway, um, it, was, it was very cool. Well, look at those newlyweds. I have to tell you, I'm gonna go home and get beaten up because she did not want me to put this in the slideshow. But look, it's Hyena, right? There's Makana Mountain. There's Mount Apulo over there. So, so, and, and, but this is my placeholder to tell you my, my story, right? So, so uh, I mean, what you have in a community like Hyena is, is really, uh, money cannot buy it. And it's all about relationships in, in your community. So, um, so it didn't hurt that I was marrying a cousin of the, one of the families of Hyena. That, you know, that, that, that was a good thing. And, and so, um, but then we, when we decided, okay, we're going to get married, she was very cooperative and agreed to get married in Hyena and have the party in Hyena, um, even though she's born and raised in Nanakuli and her family was, then moved to Maui, she has really good taste and, and she, recognized, <laughs> she, she recognized Hyena as like good stuff. So remember, I know Momona, right? So, so then we had, then we, and we got plenty of friends and family and community. So we started making a list of who we're going to invite. The problem with making a list of who you're going to invite to your wedding is not who you're going to invite, it's who you're not going to invite, right? And you don't want to offend anybody. So in the end, our wedding invitation said, just come and bring your friends. <laughs> and I was looking for our wedding invitation. I know I got one stashed somewhere, but I couldn't find it. But uh, I really, uh, but, and so, we actually planned, and I think I saw Lei over there. There's Lei back there. Uh, Lei and her family are like the masters of making parties, man, I, I tell you. And, 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 and so we started planning a party for a thousand people. And, and I don't have recipes for a thousand people, but they do. And, and, and it was unbelievable. It was really unbelievable. And, and, um, to see the community come together, I think we had like, like 800 pounds of Kulua pig. And you know, the ham youngs, and everybody was involved in, 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 in the whole party. And of course, you make a party like that, it's like a week preparation and then a week afterwards. So it's like two weeks, not just one night. And, and the amount of food and everything. So uh, about 1.30 in the morning, this couple comes up to Haole and I and they say, I have no idea who you are, but this is a hell of a party. <laughs> that is a true story. That is a true story. Yeah. And you know what? In the 60s and 70s, 
the surf was awesome. <laughs> it was unbeat, and I was like, you know, I was actually more into surfing than gardening back then. And, and it was uh, Hyena, North Shore of Kauai is the best surf in the world. And there's other great places, you, you, but you know what? We got the best. And in those days, there was only a few of us so that, you know, we'd be out surfing and we'd be telling each other to go. Nowadays, you're fighting for get one wave. You know, it's like, it's, it, 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 was, it was such an amazing experience to grow up in that time. I, I think part of it was we never have cords. So your, your board gets all bust up. Now, now everybody got cords so they get more people. I don't know. I just, anyway, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and uh, I could tell you surf stories um, for a long time. But Hyena also for us is where we raised our kids. And, and uh, we have a, a son that was born in 1985 and a daughter born in 1987. And Auntie Vi would all every time she see them, she always tell them, "You're the real, you're the real deal. You was born and raised here in Hyena." And and I think when they were growing up, they thought they was kind of their parents were kind of weird because, you know, our closest neighbor with kids their age were uh, Lynn and Bobo Ham Young, which was a mile away. Uh, we had no TV, no radio. I told you about the geckos for entertainment, and and and. But you know what? The ocean was their front yard and the mountains were their backyard. And later when they started going to Kamehameha School, their friends would ask them where they, you live in Hyena? All of a sudden they were like celebrities. And they, all their friends like come home, you know, on common weekend and they like come home and, 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 and see them. To this day they still like come home. And, and so it was really cool. and. Um, I got to spend my time, Haolema, and we, we literally would take our kids out into Limahuli Garden, tie some ropes to the trees while they were infants, like Santo walking around with his baby today reminded me of that, and, and they'd be swinging into the tree while we'd be creating the garden. It was wonderful. It was really a wonderful uh, period of time, and, um, and it was a time of discovery. So. Uh, this was, I think, one of the highlights of my, of my uh, days climbing around in the, in the, in the, in the, in the forest. Uh, this is a, the day we discovered Prichardia limuhuliensis. Uh, it's an endemic palm to, to Limuhuli Valley. Uh, we had been hiking around for a couple of years and, and, and finally discovered it up about 1,500 feet up on the side of the waterfall. And uh, we have since discovered over 100 of them, most of them growing up above the waterfall. Uh, but if you want some excitement, uh, try and climb a six inch diameter palm tree uh, without spikes and, uh, and slippery moss on it. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, but we've been able to propagate this and, and grow them. And today we have over 300 keikis that are growing in, in the botanical garden. So, um, really great story of perpetuating a, a, a very rare species. Um, but as time went on, you know, I felt a, a calling and I, I didn't tell you the story of Pohako Kane and how he came here, but it's a story of leadership. It's a story of this rock who brought his, his family to create a better life for them and persevered through challenging times and challenging uh, uh, circumstances. He never allowed his, he, when his family was dejected and depressed, he inspired them to continue on. And, and as I was growing up, I'd look out my bedroom window and see that stone up there on the top of the mountain. And I've always remembered that. And as I got further on in my career, I felt that important calling to help our community become stronger because our community has some real challenges. And um, not the least of which are the economic challenges that are tearing our community apart and causing people to leave. Um, but we have leadership challenges. We got drugs, we got you know, early teen pregnancy. We, you name it, we got it. And, and, um, and, and yet we've got an absolutely incredible community. So um, 
So in the late 90s, we formed the Hui Mak Ainano Omakana. It's a very important name for us because we felt, you know what, get enough chiefs already. We, we're not the chiefs. We're the, we're the guys in the taro patch and the farmers, the fishermen. Uh, but, and we take our name from Makana, that sacred mountain that is the icon of, of, of Hyena. And, and we, formed this, uh, we formed this group to empower our community to be able to control their destiny. And, and what set this off was sovereignty was kind of picking up and you know, some of our community dropped some trees. We were, we were basically, way back then, rebelling against the number of visitors that were coming to KA. It was overwhelming 20 years ago. And so, and, and, yeah, I know what you're thinking. But, but and we got a plan in place, but anyway. Uh, we dropped a tree across the road. I wasn't involved in that. Trying to basically take back the park. I said, you know what? We will lose. The state got far more policemen and jails than we've got community members. We will lose. And besides which, ownership, so that they were, they, everybody was upset because through the partition process, the state came in and condemned and took the land and kicked out the, kicked out the families. And, and there was a lot of eha, there was a lot of hurt. Uh, but my counsel to them was ownership of land was not a traditional value. Our kupuna thrived through a reciprocal malama aina relationship. Let's not worry about who owns it. Let's get the state to allow us to be the caretakers of the land again, to reestablish that relationship with, with the aina. And, um, and that's what we've done. And that's what spurred us to interviewing our kupuna to document how it was when they were growing up, what their values and their relationship was to the land. Um, this man was a keeper of the names of the fishing spots on the, on the reef, on the Apapa. And you know, for 20 years, he told me, Uncle Tom told me, Chip, you gotta record these names because after I die, nobody's gonna know them. Yeah, 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 we get it. You know how it is. It's easy. I get plenty going on. 20 years, he kept telling me that. And then, he, you know what, I'm forgetting some already. You better get on it. So anyway, we finally did get on it. Um, and in fact, we actually produced, I didn't bring it. How could I not have brought it? Oh my gosh. Anyway, it's, a, it, it's about that thick. Is it in here? No, I don't think I brought it. Uh, oh, I did bring it. Hana Kalima Ai Kawaha, all oral histories of the fisher folks of Hyena, from all of the families. This is the, this is the real deal. And, 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 um, and, and so look at this. This is all of the traditional place names of the reefs. Most of which had been lost or very few people continue to know them. And, 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 and this was, so I, I'm, going, I'm going to talk about the, the boundary dispute. Uh, let me see. It's very hard to see. Right here is the Ahupua boundary. Okay, so this is Makua Point, right? This is Naue over here. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. So, so here's Wainiha Bay, right? And this is a point called Kepuhi, right? So this is what they call it now, Charles, somewhere over there. I was going to say the Anchorage, but I'm showing my age. And, 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 and over here is Hyena Point, right? Makua, here's the lagoon, Maniniholo over here. Okay, so the boundary dispute. So if you think about Wainiha, it's a, it's a bay with no reefs, right? So most people, they think when they come around Kepuhi Point, now they're in Hyena. Actually, this is all Wainiha. And the reason, that, and so, so the people of Wainiha needed anapapa. They needed a reef to gather their limo and catch their fish. So the boundary dispute was over where this boundary was. Was it over here? Was it over here? Was it over here? Because they knew once this boundary was set through the Mahale process, that was it. It wasn't going to change again. So it's very interesting reading the, the, the native testimony at that time uh, associated. In the end, it was set to be a, a reef on a papa over here called Kahaki. And, and Kahaki literally means to divide. 
And it's that apapa that, that marks that and that boundary line travels right behind Auntie Vi's house. So right, so all this pasture land that you see right behind Auntie Vi's house, um, it's actually owned by the Robinsons and it's Wainiha. So even though it feels like you're in Hyena, you're actually in Wainiha. Yeah. Yes, Anto. Shipper, how, there was a balance, there's two boundaries. One day like 18, late 1800s and one day the 1900s. Is that still in effect? Or is it like so the... Because the old Hyena road used to go into our house. Yeah, so th this, is, this is one of those boundaries. And then this was, this was the boundary that got solidified uh, during the partition. But I think they, they both ended at Kahaki. Yeah. Like, right. Look at the land different, different Yeah. 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 So you can, I, I, if, if you get a better, oh, I never bring the map, I'm sorry. Um, but trust me, this map has it on it. So this is the map you got, I think we get one down at the Lo'i. Yeah, no, yeah. It shows both boundaries. Yeah. But I always thought this was really interesting because um, it just feels like you're in Hyena when you come around Kepuhi, but actually you're in Wainiha. Okay. And then, and then look at this. So this is the bread basket of Hyena. These, these colored areas represent all of the terra system in Hyena State Park. And so uh, Limahuli Stream is a perennial stream. Unlike Manoa Stream, Manoa Stream at times can dry up, you know, where you, we drive through the water by Maninihola. This Limahuli Stream averages a minimum of three million gallons a day. And, 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 and usually significantly more. It's a pristine watershed. So this, this stream allowed our kupuna to farm this area, this alluvial plain, and develop uh, an abundance of food coming out of that. And, and so uh, what we did as the Hui was we asked permission <coughs> to be the curators of the park, to go in and clear off 40 years of alien vegetation, that entire, in fact, the first time we went down here to go walk inside here was Uncle Tom, Copa, me, Carlos, Bobo Ham Young. We couldn't even, from the parking lot, we couldn't even go into the bushes, was the bushes were so thick. It was all oh, how bush and Java plum and Kamani, and you see, because I should have put some of those pictures in here. But um, anyway, we said we want to go in and restore this so, our com and so this aina can feed our community again. And, and this is where we said we wanted to start. And, um, and, 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 and we've been really successful. This was actually from a long, long time ago, like, uh, like tw 20 years ago. But tomorrow actually is our community work day. <laughs> so it's very timely that I put it up. So you're all invited. <laughs> you're all invited. And uh, the par so the parking, if you actually are going to come and work at our community work day, there's a gate right after the parking lot, which comes into where our Hui clubhouse is. And, and you can park inside there. Yeah. So, um, so this is what's, so we've turned it from forest that you couldn't even walk through into about four and a half acres of, of kalo. Um, that is harvested, shared with Waipa, and Waipa distributes it as poi to, to, to our Hawaiian community. Um, and this was Onipa on the Hui Kalo work day. This was the first day we got permission from the state. So about the first 10 years, we did it all dry land. But growing taro dry land is a, is, is a much more labor intensive process. So. Eventually, I was able to convince the state to allow us to put water back in there. And this was the very first work day that we actually restored water into the, into the Lo'i system. I, I want to make a plug for my friend's book, Hyena Through Ancestors' Eyes, written by Carlos Andrade, who was uh, worked with Ha'ole and I as part of our mapping team. This book is a fascinating read. It's full of really, really, really good information about Hyena. If, if, you're, if you're interested in it. And I just want to end by saying, being a family from Hyena has been such an incredible blessing. Uh, to be able to have our roots in, in such a special place 
has enriched us. You know, doesn't matter how much sweat, blood, and tears, and money, and whatever you put into it, you get it back ten times over. Um, it is it is absolutely an incredible place. So, um, with that, I leave you with this: Olelo no iau, heli kaaina, he kawa ke kanaka. Land is the chief; we are the servants. And and if we could, more of us could have that perspective. Um, I think, we'd, I think we would be much better stewards of, of uh, this incredible place that we all live in. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak with you this evening. And I'm open to ask, try and answer any questions you've got. So. See, Helen never told me you gotta be done in an hour or something, so I've, you know, I, I, I want you to speak as long as you want. <laughs> um, just to let you know, we have records in the Historical Society from the Haena partition. We have records from two different sides, and that's the beauty about primary resources, it's not interpreted. The primary resources are there for you to draw your own conclusions. So please take advantage of the Rizmanao and.